Welcome to Hoover Capital Conversations. I'm Tom Gilligan, director of the Hoover Institution. For more than a century, our mission has been dedicated to generating policy ideas that promote economic prosperity, national security, and democratic governance. In this series, we'll be discussing policy and policymakers. We bring Hoover Institution fellows together with policymakers for in-depth, informed discussions, examining some of our nation's most vexing policy issues. By bringing together the key players in policy development and policy execution, we hope to pull the curtain back on some of the conversations that typically take place behind closed doors. I hope you enjoy these insightful and important fireside chats between those who generate the ideas enabling a free society and those who turn them into actionable policy. As part of today's discussions, we'll be, we will be taking audiences, audience questions, and I encourage you to submit yours at, using a Q&A button located at the bottom of your screen. Today, we'll be talking about the future of healthcare after COVID-19 with United States Senator Tim Scott and Hoover Senior Fellow, Dr. Scott Atlas. Senator Tim Scott represents South Carolina in the United States Senate. He was appointed by Governor Nikki Haley in 2013, won a special election in 2014, and was elected to a full term in 2016. In the Senate, he serves on the Banking, Housing, Urban and Urban Affairs Committee, the Finance Committee, the Health, Education, Labor, and Pensions Committee, and the Small Business and Entrepreneurship Committee. Prior to that, he served in the U.S. House of Representatives and was a successful businessman. Dr. Scott Atlas is the Robert Weston Senior Fellow at the Hoover Institution. Before coming to Hoover full-time, he had a 25-year career in tertiary care medicine at the top medical centers in the country and served as Chief of Neuroradiology at the Stanford University Medical Center for 14 years. Gentlemen, thank you both for joining us today. Good to be Happy with you. Be thank you for having us. Great. Senator Scott, we originally set up this conversation a few weeks ago to discuss healthcare policy and COVID-19. But as we all know, the events surrounding the death of George Floyd are at the forefront of most people's minds. Between the issues of policing, racial injustice, and the disproportionate cases of minority COVID infections, a recurring theme of inequality seems to have emerged. Can you give us your reflections on the state of our union at this difficult time? We certainly find ourselves in a bit of a kerfuffle, to say it nicely. We have a lot of uh, moving parts with a lot of challenges that we are confronted with. And then the good news is, if you remember, if, uh, one of the things I try to do is have people reflect back on the history of this great nation. We are the only nation on earth that I know of that was willing to tear itself apart, really in half, to try to figure out how to give an oppressed, voiceless people the right to speak, a right to be heard, the right of full citizenship. That was a bloody civil war. Over 600,000 people lost their lives. I would say that looking back at the incredible sacrifice on behalf of so many Americans really is one of the reasons why I'm still hopeful as I look forward. In order for us to put some skin on that hope, we're gonna to have to be willing to digest and deal with some of the real challenges that we see every single day in the streets and some that I have been a victim of myself. The good news from my perspective is that uh, you don't have to remain a victim. You can actually become a victor and that requires us to understand the necessary steps into that future. Dealing with the police is a part of that. Dealing with the communities of color, some of the challenges that are system, system I'm sorry, systemic in the community, really mm -hmm. important for us to deal with as well. So I think if we try not to have a binary choice between supporting law enforcement or supporting communities of color, look for mm -hmm. the road that leads us all to the same future. We're in a far better shape to uh, see both of the left and the right from a political perspective come together, present solutions. Uh, I've been assigned the responsibility of digging into what solutions look like. And I have uh, been a excited about the fact that my friends on the other side of the aisle are interested in working together. And my friends on my side of the aisle are interested in working with folks as well. So this may be another one of those watershed moments that we actually see this nation coming together, as well as the policymakers coming together, looking for a single solution. Great, that's great news, Senator. Thanks for sharing that. Uh, let's, let's turn now to the uh, coronavirus crisis. Uh, Dr. Atlas, what does the data tell us now about the, the coronavirus? What have we learned and how would you, what kind of situation are we in right now? Sure, thanks, Tom. And uh, first wanna say uh, it's an honor to be here with Senator Scott, happy to uh, participate. 
Yeah, well, well, the good news is we, we've learned quite a bit. We're not in the same position that we were three months ago, uh, where, uh, and, and here's what we've basically learned. Number one, the infection fatality rate is far lower than was originally thought and that it's nowhere near what uh, actually was used to precipitate this total lockdown. The reality is it's about one-tenth or even lower than that. And the second big point we've learned is that not everyone is equally in danger from this virus. This virus is very selective and it's very sad that you know hundreds of thousands of people have lost their lives in the world. But we actually know from looking at the facts that if you're under 18, you have virtually no chance of dying and virtually no chance of a serious disease. That means children, even though there are re very rare exceptions, it, it, you know, 99 uh, plus percent of people un, uh, that die are over 35 in the United States and about two thirds are over 70. So, you know, it's very dangerous, uh, more dangerous than the flu, for instance, for older people, but for people who are under 60, the fatality rate is less than or equal to seasonal influenza. I mean, this is very important and has yet to be emphasized. And, and that has a lot of implications here because for policymakers, we know that there is no science at this point, zero in terms of closing K through 12 schools. There's no science uh, to put masks on children, to prevent them from mingling with each other to stop summer programs. And when you do these things, this is the big thing that we have learned, that when you do lockdowns, when you close schools, when you close businesses and things, one side is the safety about the disease, but what was neglected was the harm of the policy. And you can calculate, there's massive unemployment, there's, uh, and that translates into lives lost. There's also things like in indirect secondary things, for instance, child abuse is way up. I've had doctors from the emergency rooms of uh, children's hospitals in, in Michigan, for instance, where there's a strict lockdown, 35% increase in serious child abuse. We're talking about emergency room admissions. You don't bring your child in if you're a child abuser unless you think you might have killed them. Okay, so 35% increase in ER visits for abused children and by the way, when you close schools, the number one place that child abuse is, is reported is in schools. So there's just a tremendous number of consequences. And I think we're, we're finally getting some publicity to the recognition that the lockdown is severe, causes severe harms in and of itself. Amazing. Senator, at this point, what should the federal government be doing and not doing about responding to the coronavirus? Now, we had a hearing yesterday on the importance of having K-12 through uh, taken seriously about sending kids back to school. I thought that was a good step for us to listen to some of the experts in the field, get varying opinions. One of the reasons why I'm uh, fortunate enough to be here with you today is because I started reading Dr. Atlas's work. And I came to the conclusion that as a policymaker, I needed more information to come to a solid fact-driven solution. Uh, in his words, it's super sound science. And mm -hmm. I, I saw that because I, I saw those words and said to myself, that is something that everyone can digest, super sound science. And if I'm, as a policymaker, going to be driven to conclusions by super sound science, as simple as that is, is also the place of the most common sense that protects my citizens and gets us back working. So yesterday's conversation around K-12 schools opening up again was a great start. Another place where I think the the government should lean in is on Project Warp Speed, which is mm -hmm. a project around the vaccine. I think we've put about 10 or $11 billion into that project. We've also spent about $25 billion on uh, therapies and treatments that we're trying to figure out <clears throat> how to get them to the marketplace as soon as possible. About 11 billion of those dollars has gone straight to the states for their development as well. So that's something I think we should be doing. What we should not be doing is mm -hmm. relying on dated information to make our decisions. What we should mm -hmm. not be doing is suggesting that there is, the risk is so existential that we should not allow our citizens to move around, no matter the circumstances in their states or in their counties. Those are mistakes, I think, that lead to more casualties. And I would say it uh, this way as well. When I think about my home state of South Carolina, we will have tested every single nursing home resident and workers 
40,000 plus by the end of this month. Mm -hmm. If you're looking for a path to reopening, you have to make sure that you put your resources where the threat or the vulnerabilities are the highest. And Dr. Atlas did a really good job of distilling uh, in South Carolina, our numbers match about the average age of death is around 76 and a half, 75 and a half. 92% mm -hmm. of the deaths are over 60. So when you look at the facts, it allows me to target my resources in such a way that I can tell other people it's okay to socialize. It's okay to start reintegrating within your society. And it actually is a good thing for all of us. Got it. If you're just joining us, I'm Tom Gilligan, and this is Hoover's Capital Conversations with Senator Tim Scott and Dr. Scott Atlas. We will be taking questions shortly. You can submit your questions using the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen. Uh, Senator Scott, you recently introduced legislation to make the U.S. pharmaceutical supply chain less dependent on foreign countries such as China. Tell us about that. Uh, I, about four years ago, I introduced legislation called Opportunity Zones, giving us a, a way of focusing our attention on the most uh, critical communities in need, the most distressed communities in our country. There's about 8,700 of those throughout the country. We have today targeted about $75 billion in the private sector, attracting more capital and resources to build the infrastructure, open the businesses. My <clears throat> perspective is we have to find a way to make it in America. One of the fastest ways for us to attract our supply chain back to the country is my new legislation called MADE. The goal is to give tax incentives and tax credits for those parts of our supply chain that we need back in America. We would allow for a 30% tax credit off the profits of your company if you move back into an opportunity zone. And the second part of the, uh, what I call the incentive-based economy, we have to drive the behavior we want by attracting and incentivizing more people to participate in the American economy here at home and that's just one classic example of how we can make it easier for our supply chain to make the decision to come home. Got it. Dr. Atlas, as a physician and health policy expert, can you put prescription drugs and current medical care <clears throat> in perspective? How can governments help get pharmaceuticals to patients that need them? Sure. I mean, uh, first we have to realize that drugs are really a mainstay of modern medicine. In fact, uh, in the diagnostic side, medical technology and medical imaging is probably the most important advance. But in the therapy side, over the past 50 years, it's drug treatment. No matter what you read about genomics and all this stuff, that's very nascent. The reality is that drugs are critical. And in the U.S. alone, we have something like 6 billion prescriptions every year. Uh, you know, 15 million seniors use five or more prescription drugs uh, at the time. So, I mean, our, our seniors are very dependent. And, you know, this is really critical because as the aging of the population continues and we have these diseases, the big three diseases are, are uh, cancer, uh, heart disease, and stroke, they're all really critically dependent on drugs. So drugs are very important. That's number one. And, and number two, uh, we are the innovators in drugs here. I mean, we are the innovators in prescription drugs. You, we do import most of our... Uh, generics, and our generics are mainly imported from India and China, uh, including the what are called active ph pharmaceutical ingredients. Uh, but, you know, India gets a lot of theirs from China. So it's a little bit complicated to trace the supply chain as a challenge. Uh, but we know that we don't have unilateral vulnerabilities. The dependency is bilateral. China doesn't make, uh, makes hardly, hardly any of their uh, non-generic drugs. So they, they depend on our cancer drugs, for instance. And so there's this, this sort of bi-directional dependence, in my opinion, is sort of a good way to ensure uh, less problems. You know, when, when both sides, whether it's allies or adversaries, are dependent on each other, that, that would seem to be a positive, uh, but it's true that we need to keep incentivizing the innovation. I mean, the key part, and I'm thrilled to hear what Senator Scott said, is that it's really all about incentives, but also the, the climate for innovation. We are the world's innovator on healthcare, including whether it's technology, uh, biotech, and pharma, by far, more than any other country and way more than China. We mm -hmm. have to keep and maintain that climate for innovation. I think that's really critical 
uh, it, because basically the way generic drugs, which are 90% of our drugs, are made, the key bottom line is the cost of production. Whereas uh, prescription drugs that are still on patent, uh, they have a better control of their supply chain uh, because, because of the obvious. So we need to keep the incentives going for more and more innovation. I think that's the number one thing I would say. Gentlemen, I've got a couple questions here that has to have to do with the structure of our healthcare system. Uh, Paul asks, workers are arguably the most valuable asset in our economy. With that in mind, what are your thoughts about treating healthcare as infrastructure? Why shouldn't this be a national imperative? And in parentheses, he adds, and as an aside, relieve our employers of the burden their, com their competitors overseas do not have. I think what Paul's advocating for is a single payer system. Would that be better? Sri Ram asked a similar version of the question. Senator Scott, do you think that there will be a renewed push for healthcare reforms to address shortcomings in the current system? If so, what could that look like? Senator Scott, you go first, please. Yeah, certainly. Uh, so uh, I heard most of your question and we had a little hiccup there in the Wi-Fi, but the bottom line is, is there going to be a push towards a single payer system? The answer is yes. Do I think it's a good idea? The answer is no. The question in my mind is when have we seen a monopoly as a good thing? Typically it's not a good thing. The prices go down initially, then they could go back up. We think about the advent of the uh, healthcare system we have now, the ACA, the predictions back in 2009 were it's going to cost us about $900 billion. About three years later, they pushed it to $1.8 trillion. Now we have no idea what it actually cost us. So it's really difficult for us to understand the front cost, which really has more to do with the price than it does the cost. The cost, I think, is much higher than the price. The second part of that price structure, which would be a part of the cost structure, is the fact that in South Carolina, because of the, the monopoly around healthcare, we saw three or four rural hospitals close as a result. So ultimately, when there's not competition in the marketplace, we see the end of access to care in so many markets. We've seen that around the country. And frankly, we've also seen another part of that price structure that becomes a cost is that there was a ballooning of the cost of the healthcare itself. So the have a healthcare policy in America became, uh, it got more expensive, not less expensive as a result of it. So I can't imagine what would happen from a price structure, from a cost structure, and from a quality structure. There are parts of the government that many in the healthcare world says, I wouldn't want more of that. I won't yeah. point my fingers at which departments I'm talking about, but I would suggest that without much of a question, many Americans would feel terribly about paying more and getting less. So keeping the private sector as a part of the, of the engine, I think is incredibly important. Dr. Ellis. Yeah, I would echo all that and add that, you know, the evidence from all over the world was single. This is another example where somehow the facts don't matter to people. Uh, the evidence from all over the world with single payer systems all over the world are the, yes, they cost less than ours in terms of expenditures overall. And the only reason they do is because they restrict care. And I can give you an example vis-a-vis -vis the drug situation is that we have almost all, uh, 51 of 54 new cancer drugs that were introduced into the world. We had access as Americans within two years, but all the single payer systems had between 30 and 60% of the drugs were not available to them. And wow. so, okay, you know, maybe they got them five years later, but when you have cancer, that's, it's not exactly a great thing to say, okay, I'm gonna wait a few years. I mean, this is a, a, total, a total sham in terms of this idea that single payer systems have, have the same quality of care as we do. We have by all the facts, better outcomes from every serious disease, and better access to care, including things that should be simple to do in a single payer, like cancer screening. You just have to look at the facts, and, and then the facts have to influence policy. It doesn't go the other way. Yeah, got it. Michael has the following question. Uh, what are we doing to prevent the next epidemic from spinning out of control? We had an early warning system with China, but it didn't work. We had plans for healthcare stockpiles, but they were depleted. The CDC and WHO had plans but these were ignored or poorly implemented. How do we avoid this in the future? Senator? That's a great question. I don't have a fast answer for it, but I'll, I'll take a dive into it. Uh, bottom line is preparation is the key. And frankly, uh, as we look at our stockpiles, what we thought we had really wasn't there and parts that we had was obsolete. So one of the things I think you'll see going forward in this administration, as, as well as the future administrations, no matter what side of the aisle you, it comes from, 
we'll look at the stockpile and do an assessment of what we need. Frankly, we probably now have more ventilators than the law should ever allow. I say that with <laughs> tongue in cheek, but the bottom line is that we have found ourselves literally making a major investment in our strategic national stockpile of about $16 billion. And that's good news as long as we direct it towards those, re those uh, the equipment that we need long term. There is certainly no way to see around corners, but the good news is we have a lot of smart people, private sector, public sector, working at what is the worst case scenario and then planning from that worst case scenario back. One of the failures at the beginning, and from my opinion is, what we did not do was we did not have a collaborative effort with the private sector. We assumed that the public, uh, the, the government would make the best, uh, treatment possible, we'd have the best test possible. And from the testing, we found ourselves three weeks behind. Maybe Dr. Atlas could speak to that, but I think it's at least three weeks behind because our tests failed at the beginning. I think it would have been a different conversation had we had public-private partnerships at the beginning and mm -hmm. not midway through. Dr. Atlas? Yeah, yeah, I, I, I agree. And I would add, A, that, you know, what you've just said shows we've really, this is one of the big things we've learned from this pandemic is how to deal with uh, not just the stockpiles, but mobilizing resources. I think there's been a tremendous amount learned on mobilization and we're still mm -hmm. figuring that out. So I, I'm not so worried about that, but I also wanna emphasize vis-a-vis -vis the previous question, you know, the innovation, the drugs, the vaccines, they come from the private sector. That's where they're coming from. We lead the world on the drugs that are being used for investigating for this, and we're, we're gonna move forward on vaccines. That's due to our nimble, incentivized private sector. It's not government that does that. All right, so picking up on that, Scott, uh, Caden has a question, which is, I think, in response to the first discussion we had. His question is, what policies can we start to implement which will allow healthcare to move more into the free market? Doctor, I mean, uh, how about Senator Scott? Yeah, sure. Go ahead. What policies can we use to move the uh, healthcare into the free world? So in the free, market. Direction? Free, market. Free, free market direction. Yeah. So I, I spent some time at the White House recently talking about some of the challenges that we face. And there are two, I think, specific policies that would help lead us in the right direction. The first one is around broadband. Uh, much of our rural country doesn't have access to connection. If you don't have connectivity, you really can't have the next wave of healthcare opportunities coming your way, which I, in my opinion, is gonna be telemedicine. Telemedicine mm -hmm. that started during the coronavirus, or actually was really sped up during the coronavirus, will become a necessity coming out of the coronavirus. So as I think about that, my opinion is that, that we have an outdated system that will have to be updated using technology, but technology requires connectivity at home in order to have the best experts in the field come in there. So that's one of the ways that we could bridge the gap. Mm -hmm. uh, Dr. Atlas? Yeah, I think that's a great point. Is this another thing we've learned is how effective and valuable telemedicine is. And the answer to the question also stems on sort of what I would call strategic deregulation. When you have regulatory barriers to competition, you necessarily don't have the, the, the mechanisms there that cause quality to go up and prices to come down. And so we need to get rid of these barriers. And one of them actually is a, an illustration is in telemedicine. We have this archaic rule of medical doctors being licensed state by state. Whereas of course we, we want national licensure. We want doctors and, and uh, insurers and other suppliers really of healthcare to be able to compete and also to be able to be effective in things like distance medicine. So I think there's a lot of things to do strategic deregulation to introduce competition, because we all know that's how everything else works in the U.S. The more competition, the prices go down and the quality goes up. Got it. Well, Tom, before you, Tom, before you move on, just to add to what, uh, if you don't mind me adding on, on the back of yeah. Dr. Atlas, uh, one, of the, uh, one of the beautiful things that happened during the virus, it, this is part of the silver lining from my perspective, is that we saw FDA move towards emergency authorizations at a speed that we've never seen before. And what typically, from my understanding, took, would take five years to get to, we, we did in months. That tells me that there's a lot of unnecessary red tape that should be examined, eliminated, and never brought back into our system. The question is, going forward, can we get there now and not say 
that was just a unique uh, opportunity that we had no choice. Well, if we're looking at the future and future pandemics, we probably should bake into our system immediately. If it works, do more of it. If mm -hmm. it takes more time and you get the same result, do less of that and keep it kind of simple. Got it. Got it. Uh, Dr. Jefferson, Jefferson Stewart asked the following question. How should policies address the frequently disruptive divergence of prevention and intervention in medical practices? Dr. Atlas, why don't you take that one? Okay, I, I guess what the question is getting at is how to get more preventive care in. Uh, you know, I mean, there's, we all believe in preventive care and the, the sort of cardinal rule of medicine is the earlier the detection, uh, for, you're going to have a better outcome. And obviously, if you can prevent a disease, you're going to have a better outcome. That's the whole basis of doing cancer screening. That's the whole basis of looking at nutrition, uh, et cetera. I have to say that uh, we do a pretty good job of that. Uh, there's less known about how to prevent many diseases than people, honestly, that are non-medically fluent realize. I mean, there's a lot of gaps in medical knowledge. Uh, maybe it was illustrated by the virus. Uh, we're still seeing that. So I think that you know the, the basic rules of uh, preventive care are in, in some ways it's very important to do immunizations, for instance, and to do uh, cancer screening. On the other hand, you know we still don't know a lot about preventing a lot of the diseases that we sort of wish we do. So on, on some sense, preventive care is this uh, holy grail, and we're not really there yet on a lot of diseases, unfortunately. Got it. Senator Scott, I want to end with you because I know you've recently introduced legislation uh, that speaks to uh, policing issues. What do you think the prospects of bipartisan legislation on police reforms are, say, within the next uh, legislative session, within some period of time that will make a difference for our country? Well, the longer it takes outside of the next two weeks, the more likely it will not happen. I mean, mm -hmm. if you don't steal this moment here, if you don't take advantage of this moment, we won't get there. My hope is that we will find a bipartisan solution. I have legislation, as you just alluded to, that uh, I'm working with my friends on the other side to get some co-sponsors. Uh, it does very simple stuff. More, more notification so that we actually know when the use of force leads to death. 40% of our departments are providing information. We need 100% uh, providing information to the FBI or to the DOJ. If you have uh, four officers, as we saw in Minneapolis, three watching one, on top of Mr. Floyd, the, the necessity of intervening should be a common policy in every department. Uh, I've spoken to FOPs throughout the country, and it is in some places, it's not in other places. That should be a common sense solution. So what I've tried to do is craft legislation that is not conservative or liberal or for the law enforcement or against the law enforcement, but really looking at the outcome that we want as a nation and trying to drive us to that conclusion. I'm hopeful that we'll get a couple of co-sponsors that are Democrats and my Republicans will stick with it. And we'll even get the president to say something positive about it in the future, I hope. Outstanding. Senator Scott, Dr. Atlas, Atlas I wanna thank you both for a great conversation on issues of tremendous importance. Thank you very much. Yes, sir. Thank you. I wanna also thank you all for joining us today. You can learn, learn more about this series at hoover.org forward slash capital conversations. Thank you for joining us today, and I hope you'll tune in next time. Goodbye.